All right, good afternoon everybody. Let's get started. Um, so a couple things. So um, I wanted to thank everyone for or who participated in the informal survey that we did. We really take your uh, responses very seriously and so hopefully all of you at this point have seen our Piazza post about some changes that we made to the course moving forward. Um, you can find it there. It's pinned on the top of the Piazza page and there's also a link to it in our announcements page on our course website. But at a high level, um, the things that are changing are that the next three labs are going to be a little bit less work, so hopefully less time consuming. We're going to drop lab eight, and we've doubled the number of uh, free late days that you have both for recitations and for your labs. Okay, so hopefully that will help everybody feel a little less stressed out about the class. And if you do have any, you know, concerns still, then please do let us know. All right, so last time we talked about how we go about building our CPU, our central processing unit, and we talked at a high level um, about it talking to a memory, and we kind of treated the memory like a black box. And so today we're going to take a closer look at what this memory really looks like and how um, do we need to use different types of memory technologies in order to achieve um, the best performance. And so. It turns out that we've got a lot of memory technologies available to us, and so um, we you know, need to think about which combination of these or which one of these is the best for us to use. And so if we take a look at this table over here, you find that as you go down the table, the ty different type of memory technology can offer you significantly more capacity than the ones that are higher up in the table. At the same time, though, if you look at the latency numbers, as you go down the table, the numbers for latency grow significantly. And as for cost, the cost actually grows in the opposite direction. Okay? So what is this basically telling us? This is telling us that so far, you know, we've seen registers. We were told that registers are very fast and they're great to use, but we can't have too many of them. We can't have too many of them because number one, they're costly, but also because number two, if you start to have too many of them, then their performance is not going to be as good. So they're not going to be able to be as fast as if you have a small register file. Okay? So, so far we're familiar with um, you know, registers, and now we're going to see when are we going to want to use some of these other uh, memory technologies. So, as I said, the registers are part of our processor data path. And then we talked about having um, a main memory that we talk to in order to store, you know, larger amounts of data than what we can store in our registers. And so this main memory consists of two types of memory technology. One is called SRAM, which stands for uh, static random access memory, and the other is DRAM, which stands for dynamic random access memory. Um, at the end of the slides in today's lecture, you actually have an, an optional section, which is not covered. Um, in the quiz, but it actually goes into much more detail about how um, SRAM and DRAM technology works. And so if you're interested in that, do please take a look and by all means ask questions. But um, I want to make sure that we get through the part of the uh, lecture that we definitely need to get through today. Okay, so in addition to SRAMs and DRAMs, we also have what's called non-volatile memory. So what it means to be non-volatile, it means that even if I shut the power off, it's still going to retain um, the, the values stored in my memory. And so this refers to our flash drives and our hard disks, which are used, you know, to store things that we don't want to lose, but we're not accessing very frequently. Okay, so as we mentioned before, um, as we go, you know, walk down this table, we see that, you know, in order to get more capacity, I have to basically you know, take a hit on cost, right? And so there's basically this fundamental limit, which is, um, which is saying that if I want um, a large capacity, then it's going to be slow. And if I want, you know, something fast, then it's only going to be able to give me a small amount of capacity. And so, okay, you know, uh, that's how these memory technologies on their own work. But what we'd like to do is think about, can we use them in some kind of combination so that we can effectively end up with something that looks like a large, fast, and cheap memory as far as the processor is concerned. 
Okay, so how are we going to do that? The way that we do that is we basically use a hierarchy of the different types of memories in order to um, make it seem to the CPU like what it's talking to is this one large, big, fast memory. But in reality, there are several different levels of memories that it's actually talking to. And so um, at the first level, we have a very small and fast um, SRAM. And then you might move on to something that's a little bit larger. Um, thank you. And, um, and does that work? Great. A little bit larger and, uh, and uh, slower. And then finally, you know, you might move on to um, DRAM for all of our main memory uh, requirements, and that's going to be even slower yet. Okay, so let's think about, you know, how we can make the processor use these efficiently so that it actually, you know, looks to the processor like we have a fast and large memory. So there's two approaches that we can take. The first is to expose the hierarchy, okay? So we can tell the CPU, all right, you've got all of these different types of memory technologies. And so, sorry. There we go. Um, and, uh, and so you might have, you know, a small uh, SRAM followed by a somewhat larger SRAM followed by a larger DRAM and then, you know, some disk that's used for secondary storage or swap space, okay? And in this model, what is expected is that the programmer actually knows what the memory hierarchy looks like and it's the programmer's responsibility to say, okay, you know, depending on the usage um, of my particular variables, certain ones should live in the faster memory and other ones should live in the slower memory. And while that actually used to be a model that was followed um, for certain computers and, and it actually worked fairly well, the more uh, common scenario is to hide the hierarchy. And so it's something that looks like this. And this is what you'll see on most modern processors. And so essentially what you've got is you've got, as we mentioned, an increasing size of memories. But as far as the CPU is concerned, it thinks it's just talking to one memory. Okay? So at the... Uh, closest level, we have what we call a level one cache, and that's implemented with after the registers are fastest technology, which is our uh, static RAM. And then we have main memory, which is implemented using dynamic RAM. And then finally, you have your swap space, which can be with, um, give you a lot, a lot of extra memory using disk or something like that. All right. So now suppose that I want to look for an address X. How am I going to find it given that, you know, I have all of these different memories to look in? So what I'm going to do is first, I'm always going to look in my level one cache, okay, in this fast, small memory. And I'm going to say, is my, you know, the data that I'm looking for in this cache? If it is, I get the answer back quickly. Okay? If it's not, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go look at it for it in the next level of my memory. So I'm going to go search for it in main memory. Again, if I find it, great. If not, I have to go, you know, yet another level deeper. Okay? And so there's implications of the fact that we're going to be potentially getting our data from different uh, sources, and we'll get into that in a moment. Okay. So, in order, you know, to kind of figure out, well, uh, you know, I, we're saying I don't want to put the onus on the programmer to decide what should live in which one of these memories. Instead, I want it to be figured out automatically by the hardware so that I get the best performance possible, okay? So in order to be able to do that, the first thing we want to do is look a little bit at what typical memory accesses look like over time, okay? So we're going to start by looking at code. So what do we see here? What we're seeing here is that if I look over time, let's say I start right here, I'm starting, you know, I'm fetching one instruction, then the next, then the one after, and so on. And then I come back and I fetch the same set of instructions, you know, all over again. So what does that represent in your code when you do something like that? A loop. Perfect. Okay, so, and then, you know, I might have some branch instruction that takes me to somewhere else, and then again, you know, I'll have a sequence of consecutive instructions, okay? So that's one type of um, uh, memory access that we need to make, is accessing our instructions, okay? Another type, which we've learned about now, is our stack. Right? And we use our stack in order to implement our functions and to store our local variables. So what do the memory accesses to our stack look like? 
Well, within a procedure call, you're going to find that you're accessing, you know, a very small number of locations and they're relatively close to each other and you might be accessing them more than one at a time. So these, uh, sorry, not more than one at a time, um, more than once in a short period of time. And so these correspond to our local variables, okay? And every time we see a jump over here, Basically, what this corresponds to is a procedure call. And so we're now making a nested procedure call, and so we are starting to have um, uh, another what we call stack frame on the stack, which is for this, uh, the innermost, the next level of procedure, and while we still have variables for the outer one until we're, you know, we come all the way back out from, um, from this nesting. Okay, so that's what the stack accesses look like. And what about data? Okay, and so our data accesses look something like this. So what are we seeing here? In this case, when I'm seeing, you know, consecutive locations being accessed, what does that correspond to if this is data? An array, perfect. Okay, so array accesses would look something like this. And then, you know, you might have some other things that live in different locations in memory, which I access for a while, and then I move on to access a different set of variables. So there are a couple things to notice here. So the first is that over time, it is, um, in all of these cases, likely that we're gonna access, if we access a particular address, we're gonna access it again in the near future. And the other thing is that if we access a particular location, it's likely that we're gonna access a location from a nearby address in the near future, okay? That's what we see by these consecutive um, uh, fetches from memory, okay? And so <clears throat> the way that the, the reason that this holds is basically what we call um, uh, this concept of locality. And so memories have two types of locality. They have temporal locality and spatial locality. So what we mean by temporal locality is what we just saw, which is if I access a particular address at any point in time, I'm very likely to access it again in the near future. Okay, spatial locality means if I'm accessing a particular location in memory, I'm very likely to access something very close by to that location in the very near future. Okay, and so we want to, you know, take advantage of the spatial and temporal locality in determining what it is that should live in our fast and smaller um, memories. All right, so we mentioned that the fast and small memory is called a cache. A cache is basically a small interim storage component, and it's going to, um, behind the scenes, figure out for you what it is that should live in the cache. So what it is that should live in this faster memory so that you get the best performance possible. So let's take a look at you know, what, uh, how something here would work. So you've got a CPU. As far as it's concerned, it's just talking to one big memory, right? And so it's sending an address and it's gonna look it up in the cache, okay? If the data is in the cache, then it's gonna get what we call um, a cache hit, okay? So if we get a cache hit, that means the response is coming back to the processor directly from the cache. So we're gonna get it very quickly, all right? Now, if it's not in the cache, then I'm gonna get what's called a cache miss. So what happens on a cache miss? On a cache miss, I now have to go to my main memory and try to get the data from there, okay? And now this is gonna take longer. Um, and so I'm gonna have variable response times to my processor of when it makes a memory request. Um, but the one thing that we're going to do is that when we go to main memory in order to fetch something that we didn't previously have in the cache, we're going to not only return it to the CPU, but we're also going to now insert it into our cache. And so that way we can take advantage of this principle of locality because we're saying, okay, if I'm accessing something, I'm likely to want it again. So while I got a cache miss the first time I accessed it, the next time I access it, hopefully I'll be able to get a cache hit because it's now already been brought into my cache. 
Okay, so <clears throat> in real modern processors, you'll rather than have you know just one cache and one main memory, you can actually um, see multiple different uh, multiple levels of increasing size of these caches. So you'll start you know with a very small uh, cache that's super duper fast, and then you'll move on to something a little larger that's slightly slower, again to something a little larger yet that's even slower, and only then do you you know go to your main memory which uses a different kind of technology, which is the DRAM technology. Okay, another thing to notice here <clears throat> is what is this column called managed by. So in the case of caches, it's really important that we're able to give our responses as quickly as possible. So in order to do that, we're going to have the hardware be responsible for managing how the caches work, how they return information, and how they figure out what needs to live in them. On the other hand, once we get to you know, our slower technologies, then we don't have to have everything be done in hardware. And in Instead, we can allow um, software or our operating system, which we're going to learn about in a few lectures, um, be responsible for managing, uh, accessing the, the disk memory and so on. All right, so let's start, you know, to come up with a mechanism of, um, of measuring how well our cache is doing. Right? And so we're going to define, you know, these two metrics. We have the first is a hit ratio, which is basically the fraction of times that, um, that I get a hit out of all of my uh, memory accesses. Okay? So, uh, so which proportion of the time do I actually find the data that I'm looking for in my cache? Okay? The miss ratio is just the opposite of that, which is the fraction of time that I get a miss. Okay? So if I add the two of those together, I get one. Now, how do I measure how well my cache is doing? We measure it using this um, idea of average memory access time. Okay, so some of the time I'm going to get the contents that I'm looking for from my cache, which is going to be very fast, but some of the time I'm not and I'm going to get a miss and in those situations I'm going to have to pay an additional cost of going to the main memory to fetch my data. So what that comes out to as far as you know calculating your average memory access time is something that looks like this which is no matter whether I have a hit or a miss, I'm always paying the time that it takes me to go check if my cache has the piece of data that I'm looking for. Okay? Now, if I got a hit, I'm all done. If I got a miss, which happens miss ratio fraction of the time, then I'm going to pay an additional cost, which is the cost of looking up the main memory, and that's this miss penalty number over here. Okay? Any questions about that? Good. So our goal is going to be to try to minimize this average memory access time. And as we mentioned, sometimes the model that we have of our memory is slightly more complicated than just having a single level cache. And so you can apply this, um, this equation recursively, meaning that uh, you know, if you have a level one cache, then the AMAT would be the hit time of the level one cache plus the miss ratio of the level uh, one cache plus the AMAT of the level two, which in turn can be expanded uh, to the following equation, which is in terms of level three and so on. Okay? So, relatively easy. Okay, so now let's take a look at some examples to get a sense for, you know, how good does our cache have to be in order for it to, to be useful to us? Okay? So the first question that we're going to ask ourselves is, suppose I have this simple, you know, memory configuration where I have my CPU talking to a cache that takes uh, four cycles to give a response and my main memory takes a hundred cycles. Okay? So the first question I want to ask myself is, how high does my hit rate have to be so that I at least break even using my cache? In other words, I want to make sure that I'm at least not doing worse by adding my cache than I was doing by using only main memory. So when I was using only main memory, how much time did it take me for every memory access? 100, right? 
And so basically what I'm trying to say is um, given that I also have a cache, can I find the hit rate such that the average memory access time is still at least as good as 100? Okay, and so if I plug that into, you know, our average memory access time, we see the four is my hit time, which is the time it takes me to access the cache. The miss rate, or is expressed here as one minus the hit rate. And then the miss penalty is the amount of time that it takes me to go and access my memory when I didn't find what I wanted in my cache. And then solving for the hit rate tells us that we really need a very small hit rate of just 4% in this particular example in order to do at least as well as we were doing without any cash at all. Okay? All right. Well, now we want to do a little bit, you know, better than, than just at least as good as, as we were doing. And so now let's ask a different question, which is let's say that you know, the goal of putting our cache into our system is really to try to make it seem to the CPU like um, most of their responses are, uh, on, are close to the amount of time that the cache would take you to respond, right? So if the cache takes by itself, you know, four cycles, let's see if we can get an average memory access time of five cycles, okay? We want to say, what is the hit rate that's required in order to get an average memory access time of five cycles? And once again, if we plug into our equation, what we're going to find is that in this case, we need a very high hit rate, a hit rate of 99%. Okay, so now you might step back for a second and say to yourself, well, is this even possible? You know, is my cache really going to be able to do this well? And it actually turns out that because of spatial and temporal locality, our cache hit ratios are actually quite high. They might not be as high as 99%, but they can certainly be in the high 90s. Okay, and so what that tells us is that we can make the average memory access time be very close to the amount of time that it takes us just to access our cache, rather than having to pay, you know, the penalty of main memory. All right, so now that we've convinced ourselves that caches are a good idea, let's try to understand um, what's inside them, what information do we need to store in them, and how do we go about accessing them and determining whether or not we have a hit. Okay, so remember, our caches are smaller than our main memory. So for now, let's not worry about um, our, our secondary storage at all. That's going to come in a few lectures for now. So for now, just assume that, you know, the whole working set of data that your program needs can live in main memory, and um, some of that is going to go into your cache, and some of it is going to stay in main memory. And we're trying to figure out, you know, which portions need to go into our cache. Okay, so remember our cache is much smaller than our main memory and so that means that we cannot store in our cache every single address that lives in our main memory, right? And so in order to be able to tell um, when I find a particular uh, piece of data in my cache, what address it corresponds to, I not only need to store the data that came from main memory, but I also need to store information about the address that it came from. Okay, so in every cache location, I have two main pieces of information. The first is the address from w which it came from, which we call the tag, and the second is the data itself. Okay, so now if I'm doing a search for um, memory location X, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come into my cache and I'm going to see do any of my tags, you know, equal the address X? If one of them does, then I'm going to get a hit and I'm going to return the data that's on that same row. Okay? Fairly easy. Now, if none of them match my tag, then that means that I have a miss. Okay? So what do I need to do in the case of a miss? That's right. So I'm going to do a few things, okay? So here's a sequence of things I'm going to do. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to access my main memory in order to actually fetch that location X that the processor is asking for, okay? Second thing is I'm going to actually give that answer back to the CPU. But now, not only am I going to give it back to the CPU, I'm also going to put it into my cache so that if I'm going to, in the near future, ask for that location again, the next time I ask for it, I'm going to get a cache hit rather than a cache miss, 
Okay? And so, in order to put it into my cache, what do I have to do? I have to select a line, uh, uh, because my cache is of limited size, right? So I'm going to have to select a line to go into, which also means I might have to take something out of my cache in order to put this um, new piece of data in my cache. And then once I select which line it goes in, then I'm going to store in the tag field the address that's associated with this location, which is X in this case, and then in the data field, the value that came from memory, which is um, the value of memory of X. Okay? Is that clear? Any question? You have a question? Uh, don't you have to write what you have in the cache back to the main memory, even though you can write things to the cache? That's a very good question. So today we're not actually going to discuss that, so you're going to discuss that in recitations tomorrow. And so um, there are actually different optimizations that can be made about that. And so it turns out that, you know, if all you did was um, read values that were in your cache, then no, you don't have to actually write anything back because the value that's in your cache is exactly the same as what's in your memory. But if you actually performed a write in the cache, then you need some way of knowing that you you know, have modified this line in the cache. And so in that case, before you can use it, you have to first write the thing back to main memory and then only then does it become available to you. Okay, and we'll see, um, we'll, we'll see that in recitation tomorrow. Yes? When we get a miss, uh, is there like some notion of frequency of accesses in the cache such that when we want to replace something in the cache from a miss, we can remove the thing that's least frequently accessed? Yes, and that's another thing we're going to go over tomorrow, which is that the most, you know, there are different replacement policies that you can use. A very common one is what's known as least recently used. And so um, it's actually very complicated to keep an exact record of the least recently used, but we can, without too much hardware, give a good approximation of it. And so we basically, um, the way we think of it is that we're removing the least recently used thing because because that's the one that's the least likely to be requested again. Okay, good question. Any other questions? Okay. So, um, so the next question, you know, we have to ask ourselves is, all right, so if I'm looking, you know, for an address X, how do I know where in my cache I need to go to look for it, right? Do I have to look at every single line of my cache? What do people think? Probably not. That probably wouldn't be a very efficient design, right? So instead, we define um, uh, some constraints on our caches, which basically make the search process a lot easier, okay? So we're going to talk first about the simplest kind of cache, which is called the direct mapped cache. The way a direct mapped cache works is as follows. Suppose that you have 2 to the W, or in this case, um, in this example, 8 lines in our cache, okay? We're going to need W index bits in order to select one of those 8 lines of the cache, okay? And so what we do is we find those W index bits from, from a portion of our address, okay? So let's see what that looks like. So actually, before we do that, let me just um, mention one other thing. And so, so far, we've seen that we have, you know, data in our cache and we have our tag field. In this slide, we're introducing one more field, which is a valid bit. And anybody have any ideas why I might need a valid bit? Yep. If you have enough stored anything in there, then you don't want to look at anything in that's right. So like when I start up, right, the information in my cache is going to be garbage. So I need to, you know, mark my line as valid once I've actually brought something from main memory into the cache. And so I have some real data in that line of the cache. Okay. So when we actually check for a cache hit, not only do we need to compare um, our address to the tag, but we also need to check that the valid bit is one. Okay? Now, let's take a look at how we compare, you know, this 32-bit um, address to see whether or not it's present in our cache. So we split up our address into a few fields. The first are the bottom two bits, and we call these the offset bits. Now, because our addresses are byte addresses, but our um, data is a word, which is four bytes, the bottom two bits of our address are always going to be zero, zero. 
Okay? And so we can ignore those bits from our address as far as determining which part of our, uh, of our cache we want to look into. So then we said, okay, well this particular cache has eight lines in it, and so I need three bits in order to select one of those eight lines. Okay, so the next three, three bits are going to be what we call the index bits. Okay, and so in this particular example, the next three bits are 0, 1, 0, and so that tells me that I should go look at line 2 to see if um, it contains the tag that I'm looking for. Okay? And then the rest of the bits are going to be the tag bits. Okay? And so once I've determined that I'm looking at row 2, I'm going to take the rest of my bits up here, which are 27 bits left, and compare it to the tag field, which is also 27 bits wide. And I'm going to see, do I have a match? If I do have a match, then I'm going to check, is it also valid? And if it is, then I get a hit. And at that point, I would return the data from that row. If it's not, then I get a miss, okay? So very quickly, who can tell me why I want to have, you know, this funny number of bits for my tag rather than just storing the entire address? Yeah? Uh, it makes it faster to find it in the cache. It makes it faster, you said? Yeah, you can find the tag faster. Uh, why would it be faster to find 27 bits than 32 bits if I still have eight lines? Um, don't the index bits correspond to a line? The index bits correspond to a line, but what I'm asking about right now is the number of bits in the tag. So I could ha have actually stored all 32 bits of my address in the tag field, but instead I chose to only store the things that were past the index field. So, yeah. Because you have to look in twice. Say that again? You, uh, this way, you only have to look 32 bits so you can do it in a single cycle or not, in a single step that the memory needs. That's true, but there's really a more fundamental reason than that. A more fundamental reason is that we're limited for space, right? So we want to make every bit count. And the bottom five bits, we can already figure out based on which line of the cache I'm looking at. Okay, so if I'm looking at line two of my cache, I know that it corresponds to the index 0, 1, 0 and offset bit 0, 0. So there's no need for me to store those five bits as part of my tag. It's efficient to just store the top 27 bits rather than all 32. Is that clear? Great. So, yeah? Wait, why do we... Is the goal, I guess, first, is it the tag that's referring to the position of the data in the memory or in the cache? The tag, uh, it holds information in order to tell you what the address was in the main memory. So does that mean you couldn't... <coughs> The tag of 27 bits would only work if the memory had less than or equal to 2 to the 27. No, the tag of 27 bits still corresponds to uh, an, an address that's 32 bits, but the bottom five bits we can figure out by which line of the cache it's, re it's stored in. Okay? Well, how do you figure out? <coughs> In other words, if it's stored in line 2, the index is 0, 1, 0, and so I can fill in what the next three bits are here, and then the offset bits are always 0, 0, and so basically by knowing that I'm, something is stored in this particular line of the cache, it implies that the bottom five bits are this encoding. So then you can't have more than one you can't have more than one index, or I guess one data value in the memory with an ending, like with the same lap. Correct. You can, so our cache is not big enough to store everything in, in, in memory. And so it is going to be the case that multiple addresses are going to have the same index field. 
Okay, and so that means that multiple addresses are going to map to the same line in my cache. And in fact, that's actually what sometimes causes us to have a miss because if I have, I'm trying to access two things, both of which map to index two, then I'm only going to be able to hold one of them. And so I'm not going to necessarily get a hit the next time I go to look for it. And we'll see more examples of this. So let's, let's try to go on. But let me just ask one last question, which is why do I choose the bottom bits of my address for my index? Index. Any ideas? Yes. Um, the bottom bits are most likely, like, probably the top 32, like the top bits of the 32 byte address wouldn't be used, so they would all be like the same number, while the bottom ones would probably have more variety and you would fill the entire cache. Um, that's true, but also the main reason actually is that it allows us to take advantage of spatial locality. Can anybody tell me why it takes advantage of spatial locality by using the bottom bits? Yeah. So like if you have two uh, things that you're trying to store, like two lines of code, they're going to be offset by one. And so your, your last five bits are most likely to change if you're like very close to each other. And that's exactly right. So basically two consecutive lines of code would have addresses that are four bits apart and so their indices would not be the same, meaning that they would map to different lines in my cache. Okay? And so since I want to be able to have both of those things live in my cache at the same time, this is a good design decision. Okay? All right, so let's take a look at this example here where we have a 64 element direct mapped cache. And um, we're looking for the address 0x400c and we're trying to determine whether or not, you know, it's present in my cache. Okay, so what do I have to do? First thing I'm going to do is take this hex address and convert it to binary so that I can figure out the different fields. Okay, and then what did we say? The bottom two bits are my offset field, right? So my offset field is just 0, 0. Because I have 64 elements in my cache, how many bits of index do I need? Six, right? Two to the sixth is 64, and so I have six bits of index. So the next six bits are going to specify which line in my cache I should look up. And in this particular case, it's three. So I'm going to look up line three. And finally, the remaining bits are 0x40 with a bunch of leading zeros before that. Okay, so I'm going to come here to line three and I'm going to check the tag and I'm going to say, okay, is the tag that I'm looking for equal to the tag that's in line three? And is it? Yes. Yes, so I have a hit. Okay, and so I have a hit, so I'm going to return the data that's stored at that line, which is this 0x424242, etc. Okay, now suppose that instead of looking for address 400C, I had looked for address 4008. Okay? In this case, would I have a hit or a miss? So the only difference in the address is that this bit right here, which is the bottom bit of the index, is going to become a zero instead of a one. So let's try to figure this out. So we've got an index of two. My tag is still the same, which is 0x40, and my offset is still 0, 0. So if I go and I look at row two, do I get a tag match? No, right? The tag in row two is 0x58, which means that it's holding some other piece of data, not the contents of address uh, 0x4008. Okay? All right. So. Um, this bottom bit just says what we said already, which is that the index bits together with the tag bit uniquely identify a 32-bit address. Okay, so now let's think about another parameter to, continue, to consider, which is block size. Until now, we've said that every single line of our cache has just one word, okay? But you can imagine a scenario where instead of having one word, um, I want to take advantage, further advantage of spatial locality and say, well, if I'm going to access, let's say, address um, 104, it's likely that I'm also going to want to access address 100 or address 108, and so while I'm going and fetching 104 from memory, why don't I also bring into my cache the ones that are nearby so that then when I access these nearby locations, I'm going to get a hit rather than a miss. Okay? And so that's the thought process behind having a block 
blocks that are more than one word wide. And then there's a couple advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that now for every four words, I'm only storing one tag, okay? So now instead of having, you know, a huge overhead where my tag is almost half of the bits of my cache, I now have, you know, a t one tag for every four words, okay? And so that means I can store more actual data in my cache. A disadvantage, however, is that as I make this really, really wide, if the total number of words that I can store in my cache is fixed, then the number of rows is going to shrink. And as the number of rows shrinks, then it means that I'm going to have um, potential for more uh, what we call conflict misses. Okay, and we'll see some examples of that in a moment. All right, so let's first understand, you know, how we would change our addressing scheme in a cache that has um, a block that's larger than size one. And so what's going to happen is now the bottom two bits continue to be zero, zero in order to get our word alignment. But now we use two more bits in order to select which one of the four words we're referring to, uh, uh, the four words in that line, okay? And so these bits two and three are going to select, uh, is going to be a control to this multiplexer which selects one of these four columns, okay? And then the rest of it is still the same. I have four four rows in this cache and so I'm going to need two index bits and then the rest of the bits are my tag bits. Okay? All right, so now let's consider, you know, some trade-offs, like how large do we want these block sizes to be? Do we want them, you know, to be 256 words? Do we want them to be just four words? So in order to analyze that, what we want to do is we want to think about it, uh, the effect of the block size on the average memory access time, okay? So there's a few things that go into figuring that out. The first is how long does it take us to access from memory blocks that are larger than size one? And so here we see our miss penalty, which basically shows us that for accessing just that first word, you know, we have some fixed cost that it's going to cost us to go to main memory. Then to access nearby locations, it is going to be a little more expensive, but not that much more expensive. It's not going to be twice as much as if as what I got, you know, just the one word. And so it might be beneficial, you know, to let's say get four words at a time because I'm just paying an incremental cost for that fetch. All right, what about my miss ratio? What happens to my miss ratio as my block size goes up? Well, my miss ratio, initially, it's going to drop because um, we're going to take advantage of spatial locality. But if I make my block size too large, then what's going to end up happening is that I have too few rows in my cache. And then as a result, I'm going to have um, conflict misses or misses due to uh, temporal locality, OK? Because I won't have enough different things I can store in my cache. And so, you know, we find that if we put these two things together and look at the average memory access time, um, initially it starts to drop as we increase the block size, but eventually you start to actually get worse. And so uh, typically a good size um, for a block is about 64 bytes or 16 uh, words is a typical block size that you'll see in a modern processor. All right, now let's take a look at, you know, some examples of, um, uh, of different types of accesses and how they would perform in our cache, okay? So imagine that I have a large cache. It's got 1,024 uh, rows in it, or let's just say there's one word per, um, per row, and I have a very small program, okay? My program consists of three instructions, let's say I1, I2, and I3, and three data elements. D1, D2, and D3, okay? And we're going to consider two different scenarios. The first scenario is when our, that our code starts at address 1024, and so this is 1025, this is 1026, and our data is at address 37, 38, and 39. And for the sake of this example, we're just going to talk about word addresses. We're not going to worry about byte addresses, okay? So, in order to figure out which of our cache lines 
address one, uh, word address 1024 is going to go into, you're going to find that the index bits are zero, okay? Because the bottom bits of, the, uh, you'll basically fit words zero to 1023, you know, in your cache, and then you would wrap back around to location zero for, um, uh, for address 1024, okay? And so what's going to happen is that my instructions are going to end up in line zero, one, and two of my cache, and my data is going to be in 37, 38 and 39 of my cache. So if I'm executing this loop repeatedly, after the first time that I fetch those um, three instructions and those three pieces of data, every other time through the loop, I'm going to get a hit in my cache because both my data and my instructions are going to be there. Okay, But now suppose that I make a very small change, which is I have the exact same piece of code, exact same piece of data, but instead of living you know, at address 37, now my, ad my data lives at address 2048, 2049, and 2050. Okay? So if I analyze what happens in this situation, what's going to happen is that word address 2048 also maps to index 0. And so what's going to happen in my cache? Well, first I'm going to fetch into, into line 0 instruction 1. Then instruction 1 is going to say go load data element 1. Well, data element 1 also goes into line 0. And so I'm going to have to take this thing out of my cache and replace it with data 1. Okay, and so now when I come back and repeat my loop and I'm now looking for instruction one again, instruction one is not there because it was replaced by data one. And the same thing will hold true for all of my other um, instructions and all of my pieces of data. And so in this example, because of the fact that my instructions and my data are mapping to the same indices, I'm going to actually get a miss every time through this loop. Okay, so my performance can be drastically different just because of where my data happen to live. So how do we address this? This is what's called conflict misses, where multiple things that we were trying to access map to the same location in our cache. So you can say, well, what if, you know, instead of only being able to map one thing to that location, I could map multiple things, okay? And so this is what we call um, an n-way set associative cache. And so it basically a bunch of direct mapped caches operating in parallel, okay? So how does this work? Everything is pretty much, if I'm just looking at one of these, it's exactly the same as what we saw before. So I would have, you know, some index bits which tell me which row to look at. But the only difference is that now it can be in, you know, in any one of these four ways. Okay, so let's first talk a little bit about nomenclature of these um, uh, n-way set associative caches. So the rows are called sets because basically an index corresponds to a bunch of different locations that a, a piece of data can go, uh, can go to, okay? And so anytime you're trying to look for a piece of data, you're going to look in the entire set um, which corresponds basically in this picture to an entire uh, line that goes across, you know, all four of these, okay? And then the, um, each of these vertical things is what we call a way, and so in this example we have a four-way set associative cache, which means that for any index, there's a total of four different places that we could store that index in our cache. Okay, so in this example, where both um, my instruction and my data map to the same index, I would now no longer have a problem because I would be able to put both of these into my four-way set associative cache. Um, I can have up to four unique things that map to index zero. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions about that? Great. So how do we access, you know, uh, an n-way set associative cache? Um, let's take a look at, sorry, 
uh, let's take a look at basically what our um, addresses would do. So basically what we would do is we would again take the index um, from, uh, the, from our address and the index would select one of these lines or one of these sets and then we would have to compare the tag of each one of these ways to see if the piece of data that we're looking for is in any of those four ways. Okay? So while that gives us more flexibility in terms of trying to reduce these conflict misses, it is more costly because now I have to have these four comparisons happening in parallel, whereas before I was just doing one. Okay? And so, you know, there are these trade offs between these different considerations of how do we organize our cache in order to end up with um, an optimal uh, performance. And depending on your application, which cache works best is actually going to be a different answer. Okay, so then we have, you know, the very extreme case, which is what we call a fully associative cache. So a fully associative cache is where you've gone all the way to getting rid of all of these lines and you now have one single line and all of them are operating in parallel. And so you have as many comparators as you can store um, words in your cache. And so the nice thing about a fully associative cache is that you have no conflict misses. As long as you have room in your cache for something, then it's not going to conflict with something else. The bad thing about fully associative caches is that they're very costly, okay? Because now you need a, a comparator for every single one of those words, okay? So typically what you're going to find is you're going to find that direct map is too constrained, fully associative is too expensive, and we're going to pick some, you know, low number of say four or eight or 16 way associative cache will give us most of the performance that we need. Okay, so just to wrap it up for today, um, so this is how you would look up uh, an address in a for in an n-way set associative cache. So once again, if we assume you know we have just one um, uh, word per block, then the bottom two bits would be our um, would be zero zero. If we had multiple blocks, then say if we had four words per block, then the offset bits would actually be uh, the bottom four bits. Then depending on the number of rows or the number of sets that we have, that's going to specify how many bits of index do I have. And so the index bits are going to select a set. And then the remaining bits are my are my tag, which I'm going to compare to the tag from that row of every one of my ways. Okay? So as I mentioned, um, there's some additional information at the end of, uh, of the handout that just goes into some detail about um, how SRAMs and DRAMs work. I'd be happy to talk to anybody who's particularly interested in that uh, about it some more. And then tomorrow in recitation, you're going to uh, start doing some cash problems and we're going to do some, uh, some talking about some of these things that came up in questions today, like the replacement policy and the right back policy. All right, thanks everybody.